Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael Russell, I'm third degree black belt under Mark Walder and I run Odyssey BJJ. It's a hard question to answer because it is everything, it's giving me everything. Like, I don't know what I would be doing without Jiu Jitsu, I don't know where my life would have gone. It's given me lots of friends, lots of great moments, I've traveled the world. That's one of the big things, I've been all over the world with Jiu Jitsu. And I've, I basically, I feel like not had to work because I've been doing something I loved my whole, my whole adult life. And I've made a living out of that. So yeah, I just, I can't even put into words what Jiu Jitsu has done for me. So lots of things. I think the first thing that I, I like that I'm competitive. I was always competitive when it comes to sports. That were, and that you know I went into the gym. I started out with Mark, and that was the first thing that got me. was a competitive nature. So like I didn't want to be. I went in there, and of course, like everyone, I got beaten, and I didn't want that. You know, so that made me start to come to come back, and that made me go home and think more about it, and that made me it just made me go to training. You know, just competitive nature, the physical aspects. You know, it's like physical sports. Um, and then just the environment. I like. I loved that team. I loved those days with Mark, and he meant a lot to me. You know, and I suppose the better I got, the more I fell in love with the sport. And I just kind of realised that you can be as good as you want to be. It's how much you put into it is what you're going to get out. You know? I say that now to my students. Like everybody's got the ability to get as good as they want. Like, the only person that can really train you is you. You know, you, you learn the moves, you get taught the moves in the class, the same as the other people in the class, but how many of people take it in? I used to go home, I used to write everything down. So that made me start to, I could see the improvement, I could feel the improvement, you know, going back to the club and then, you know, overcoming challenges, overcoming people that used to be better than used to beat me. And then that, the more that, that got addictive, you know, that's what I fell in love with, that, that feeling of progression and I could be as good as I wanted to be as long as I was willing to put the time in and I had the time and that was it really. Just, once I started, I just didn't ever stop. Um, well, I was already into UFC and a long time before. I think people nowadays, everyone knows what it is. Back then it was a very small number of people that knew what that was. Most people that started back then had the same story which is you saw that the early UFC you stumbled across Hoyas Gracie and that was me I found the videos I saw the videos I become a bit obsessed with watching those videos I loved Hoyas and I knew I wanted to do that I wanted to do Jiu Jitsu and I actually looked the, it was, the internet was I think it was around then but it was wasn't what, obviously what it is now and I think I looked into the yellow pages I was looking in <laughs> and I found Mark's Club found Hoyas Gracie Jiu Jitsu Network in Dagnum and I didn't live far so that was the first thing it was, I think there was only two Hoyas Gracie, which, who was the name? That was the name then, obviously. That was, there was two Hoyas Gracie affiliated gyms in the UK. One was in Scotland, Rick Young, and one was in Dagenham, pretty much where I lived. So um, that was, for me, that was the sign. I had to do it, you know, so that's how I got into it. I went into the academy um, and just, that's it. I never stopped. Mark Walder, that's the, that's the mentor to this day. I was very lucky to walk into his gym and that was because I think my personality then, if I had gone into a lot of gyms, I might not have stayed, I don't know. I'd, I didn't, maybe, I wouldn't maybe have connected with other coaches or other gyms. Like today, I, I see a lot of gyms and, you know, it was different then. It was, it's hard to explain, but it was different right back then. And I don't know, I just had, I love Mark. I had that respect for him that, you know, I don't think, there's the same thing nowadays. You know, I had that for him that I only used to go and compete for Mark. That's the reason I did it. I loved him from the day I went in the gym. He just had that respect for him. He was a brown belt. Back then there was no black belts in the UK. There was a few good blue belts in the club. And then there was, if a purple belt came in, everybody was, wow, look, there's a purple belt. It was literally like that. Mark was a brown belt. He was like, God, he was a brown belt, you know? 
and just the way he's a person as well. Not only his jiu is amazing, uh, not only is his jiu -jitsu, for a small guy, so, so good. Um, but just the way he's a person, if anyone has a has spent any time with him and talks to him and, and gets to know him, we'll see he's, he's a special guy. Like, he's very, very clever, uh, very caring, um, and he always took care of me. And I was quite lost a little bit when I went there. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I walked in and um, I was sort of doing jobs, but I didn't really, there's nothing I wanted to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then, I don't know what he saw in me, but he kind of took me under his wing a little bit and put time into me. And then obviously I was repaying him. I hope in competition, I was going and winning everything I could, I could compete in. And that just built a relationship up more. And yeah, he's my mentor to this day. I still train with him every, every week, every, normally every Wednesday I train with him. Uh, still very, very close to him. So hopefully that'll be like that till the day, you know, the day one of us goes. Hi, my name's Mark Walder. I'm a fourth degree black belt in the art of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu under Maestri Mauricio Gomez. I remember Mike when he first came in as a gangly white belt, to be honest with you. And at, at first you don't think anything of it because they're like smiling assassins, some people, you know? And he came in and he was interested in learning Jiu Jitsu. And, and at first he was like a, any other regular white belt, I guess. But then you, you watch people how they roll and you watch people how they perform the techniques and how they combine the moves and their attitude towards, you know, self-development. And then you see that, you know, that passion come out in them and that driver, and then you want to support that as much as you can, you know, because everybody's got potentiality, but some people just, they've got a, like a, almost a natural sort of affinity for a particular art or for a particular subject or whatever it is and you can see that there's certain people that will just pick it up in an instant really and then some people get there but they have to work a lot harder at it and it and and at that point it's only potentiality so you can nurture it and you know push it a little bit and the danger is when someone's naturally gifted and talented in something they don't work as hard as they might and i'm not saying that's the case with mike because Mike was, was always very driven and very self-motivated and he was, he was very um, autonomous in the way that he, he, he was actively, I want to compete, I want to fight, I want to I wanna push, push hard. And, and I think with, with Mike at the time, it was probably an age thing. It wasn't anything to do with his personality because he's a wonderful human being and we're very dear friends. But when you're young, you, you sometimes you need someone to kind of just pull on the rein a little bit and say, look, you know, you're capable of smashing these people, but you, you've got to develop yourself holistically as well. You know, like some people think it's just all about, oh, I, I know I learn a, a technique and a move and I can then go and perform that. But we all know, um, based on, on what we experience and what we see, that the, the high level guys, it's not just they're really technically gifted or they're really talented physically or they're athletic. They, their, their mind is focused and it's driven and it's, you know, they, they, and this was Mike as well. Mike like would dump everything. Like he wasn't interested in, you know, you know, going out and partying and, you know, dating girls. And, and I'm sure he was into girls when the opportunity arose, like we all are, if you're that way inclined. But generally speaking, it was jujitsu, jujitsu. So my hardest, I think my hardest battle with Mike was just to kind of just, just pull him back on the reins because he was running as hard as he could. And and I was, you know, as a coach and as a teacher and uh, as a mentor, whatever you want to call us, the people that are leading the group or teaching the sessions, is it, anything is dangerous in extremes. You know, if you, if you don't push hard enough, you're not going to get there. If you push too hard, you might trip up and fall on the way. So it's only through our own lessons and our own sort of, bumps and bruises and um, the way that we deal with our problems that we can try to help other people from ending up making similar or the same mistakes. But sometimes you have to let people make the mistake for them to learn the lesson. You know what, for me, Mike would be as close to a complete package of a teacher and a fighter combined. I always struggled in competition to get my head around the, the whole, you know, people watching you, the expectation and because of who I am and, 
you know, my students always expecting me to do really well because you rolled around on the mat and people go, oh yeah. And I'm not, I'm not the toughest, nastiest guy. So I have to really, really push myself. Whereas I found Mike was just, he just took to it very naturally. He was just, he had the flexibility, had the, the, the mindset, had the, um, all of the natural attributes that you, you would. The biggest compliment I could pay Mike is, uh, if I could have half of the success in competition, and I'm not talking about medals, forget that, it's not about winning and losing, but the way he would express himself in the competition, you know, the way that he would just be free with his jiu-jitsu and, you know, have that um, carefree attitude to just open up and, you know, put people in all sorts of entanglements and, you know, just it's just wonderful, to it's exciting to watch, whereas I guess someone like me who plays a little bit safer is probably a little bit boring. I'm Danny Allen, uh, first degree black belt. I've been training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu since October 2005. Uh, I've been training martial arts since 2000. He's, he's just unbelievable. He's on a different plane. I mean, I can hold my own against most people, and him, it's just, it's just another level. When you get on the map with Michael Russell, you feel like you've been doing something else for the last 15 years. Like you've been playing a different game. He's just everything. I can see what he's going to do before he does it. I can't read his game. I can't stop it. My best thing to do when I spar with Mike is I go at a certain pace. I go too fast. I go too slowly, but I'll go at a very steady pace enough to watch what he does. Yeah, I'm not going to go and rush and try and beat him up. It's just a waste of time. One of a kind. And yeah, everybody else is sort of. You can have a good spar with him. It's just. Just someone to learn off, even when you're sparring. Incredible, really. Lots of different people. Um, I used to like to watch Braulio Steamer a lot. He was tall and long legged like I was. He played a lot of guard. I used to watch him a lot. I used to watch Fabio Leopoldo um, and Leo Santos. I used to watch those guys. I used to, again, YouTube and, and things weren't like they are today. You, I had like certain books or videos, like old videos and sometimes DVDs obviously were coming in then as well. Braulio was a big one for me, like, because of the guard, because of the, just the triangles. I used to watch him a lot, I still like Braulio. I still do, you know, I still sometimes, you know, stumble across the old old videos and stuff that he does. Based upon my build, Braulio, but as you said, over the years, just different people came through, different th people doing different things. I would pick up what I could and then drill. I used to, you know, drill a lot of what I saw. Uh, I think that's what developed my game, Bernardo Jr. I like him, I like his style, he's athletic, he's flamboyant. I like that style of jiu-jitsu, you know, I like people that go for stuff. You know, he doesn't win all the time, he doesn't win all the matches, but he's he's entertaining, that's what I like. I like those guys. I always, like, in competition, I used to seem to get triangles. It was a strange one because I didn't feel like I used to do that much in training, but in a competition, I would always get triangles. I do like triangles, I, you know. The problem with triangles is people fight like hell when you got them, so a lot of the triangles finish, finish with the armbar anyway. Anything on the arms, I, I like attacking the arms, like reverse armbars, I like any kind of armbars. There's nothing that like I like more than anything else. I, I just find myself attacking the arms more than, more than anything, yeah. Guard, that was, that was my game for a long time, guard, you know, when I was between white and purple belt, predominantly it was guard, it was, you know, sweeps, sweeping people over the head, trying to set triangles up, trying to set arm bars up. And then obviously I, as time developed, I, I started working more taking the back, you know, brown belt and then, then more top game stuff. So yeah, especially in my um, early competition career, it was a lot of triangles. Every Sunday I would drill, it didn't matter if it was raining, snowing, Christmas day, I didn't care, I used to drill every Sunday. And the guy I used to drill with, Tony McKee, he's still about, he, he actually teaches down this gym now still. I had mats. I had mats at home, he had mats at home, and that was it. We, we drilled every Sunday, and what was great about that, that was such an important part of my uh, development. But nowadays, when people drill, they come in, they joke around, they talk, they mess around, they get their phones out. We were like very, very serious at the time. It was like, I came every Sunday with what I wanted to drill, and he came with what he wanted to drill, and it was like 10 minutes on the timer, your go, my go, your go, my go. We did that four times each usually, about five times each. 40 or 50 minutes each, we'd get every Sunday just drilling. And what we would do is I would pick, I would come with one or two things or one area, and then I would do, for 10 minutes, I would do that. Maybe I would 
work on double legs with him and it's, he might work on clutch hooks. I know, so whatever it was I wanted to do, I would do it for, sometimes I would go into my, my second uh, 10 minutes, I would do it again. But it was more like that, it wasn't really hours, but it was consistent drilling, um, you know, very little messing around, very little talking. If I tried to talk to him in his 10 minutes, he said to me, Talk, talking is your go. Like, it was like that, it was kind of like, we were both just there for, to get better. And, and I think if, Tony was a massive part of actually my development, because we did that for five, six years, and every Sunday. And, and like, that doesn't happen now, people don't do that. People come to class, they do the class, they learn the moves, they go home, they come back and they expect be able to do the move. No, you have to drill, 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 drill. You have to repeatedly drill that. And then you have to go to the class and then you have to you have to try things out and then you have to come back to the session and drill again. And a lot of it was ideas in my head, a lot of it was stuff that I saw, a lot of it was stuff that I was taught. But it was those hours of drilling that drove me on beyond people. I think pushed me to get to a higher level because they weren't doing that and people don't do that. And the ones that put that time in, that's the difference. If you're willing to do that, you'll see massive improvements compared to everyone who doesn't do that. Maybe I don't give Felipe enough credit. He did have a lot of influence on my top game, my passing. I don't think people appreciate how good he is or was. He had one of some of the best guard passing that I ever saw. Like, he was fantastic. Like, really, really was. Uh, he probably is, you know, still day. I presume he's still training. You know, I don't really talk to him now, and I know he's not living over here. But he had a very simple guard game, and it would normally sort of involve standing back up with a single leg, taking people down, and then he just could pass anyone's guard. He just had amazing guard passing, but he, he improved my takedowns a lot and my passing, my judo and my passing. So I spent a couple of years training with him, and it was massively beneficial. I think that period really took me on from good, good purple belt to sort of a black belt. You know, that, that period was you know, very important. In terms of like name and the reputation, the smaller competitions, but on that day had the guys, had the best guys. I always remember like, there was a competition back then called the Bristol Open. And I remember it wasn't, again, it wasn't like today where you can see who's there, who's, you don't know who's, who's turning up till you turn up. And we'd walk in and you'd look around and go, fuck, he's here, he's here, he's here, he's here. Do you know what I mean? And I remember one day when went to one of those competitions, the best guys in that division were in that room on that day. And it was the sort of thing that would happen once a year, maybe like the National, the, the, the Seni, the, the British. And it happened in a small comp. And I remember winning that that day. And that was that was the one of the ones that um, I was most proud of because, just because of who was there. And the matches, the tough matches, you know. And I spent such a large period of my life, I don't lie, my, in my, between, you know, the ages of like 18, 19, all the way up to like 26, 27, competing. That was all I did, I trained and I competed. And I didn't do other things, you know, and I, I just got to that stage where I had good reputation and I had lots of medals, but I didn't have any money and I hadn't done things, I hadn't been places, I wanted to do other things. So I focused a bit more on teaching, opening gyms, developing students. And I wanted to, just wanted a break from focusing fully on my training, you know. I think when you start teaching, that much you teach full time, it's hard to get your training in. It's hard to, and especially to get your training in to the level you need to do to compete at adult black belt. You know, you need to be full time focused on that. And I couldn't be anymore. I was teaching too much. I was trying to make a living because it's all good when you're young and money doesn't matter and um, nothing else matters. And that's how it was for me. And. I didn't care about anything else. I just wanted to judge it so when I was younger, but that doesn't last forever. You know, you get to a stage where you, you want to try and build a life and you need money to get anywhere. So my focus just had to change a little bit. I would love nothing better. And I would now I love nothing better than just train jiu and compete. That's all I ever wanted to do, but it's not going to, it's not going to pay the bills. It's not going to buy me a house. It's not going to, you know, pay for things. So um, that was what it was. And I felt like I, so it was a combination of needing a break, wanting a break, wanting to do other things, and then the biggest factor was probably not training like I needed. You know, I needed to be training and drilling. I had to. I wasn't doing that anymore. I wasn't doing that drilling I was talking about earlier. I wasn't doing rounds and rounds of sparring. I was jumping in the class here for ten minutes, jumping in there for ten minutes, and that was that's really not enough. I don't think. You know, when I. Uh, 
do have something coming up, I need to focus on it and I need to train for it properly because I don't want to go out there and, and underperform. So um, I'm just that really in. You know, I'm getting older now, but I still have plans to compete at some stage. I would say just any, any, anyone really, I, I'd rather like can fight someone that's in a similar bracket to me in terms of age and weight, that's it, really. But yeah, it's not really, you know, I mean, I've had, I've had discussions before about, again, about doing super fights and I get offered like 24 year old kids, you know, and I just think, I don't, that's not what I want at the moment. That's because I knew when I was that age, what I was like. I was living, breathing Jiu Jitsu. And I'm not doing that nowadays. I want to, I want to not compete, but I want to compete against somebody that is in a similar position to me, you know, that's teaching Jiu Jitsu, that wants to go and have a match. That's what I want. So, yeah, we'll see. When I, when I come back, we'll see what names are out there. I can be middleweight, it could be medium heavy anywhere in that bracket anything over 30 really i just don't want to go and fight adult black belt again you know not in the moment you know i don't know if i've got the the fitness anymore but you know i feel i've got the i feel i've got the skill to compete at that level but it's just a different energy and a different fitness and different drive when you're young you know um so we'll see i don't know i mean i, I guess it's i guess it's developing a lot i know the 90 games changed a lot it's gone towards the leg locks which i kind of feel is has ruined it a little bit. Gi Jiu Jitsu, I don't know. I mean, again, I think it's very, people want to win the comp, uh, want to win the match so, so much that they either look for the cheap, quick submissions or they play a strategy that will get them to win. There's not that exciting style that I like Jiu Jitsu. I, you know, I like to go for the match, I like to be open with, and, and, and try stuff and go for stuff. And, you know, you do risk losing playing that game, but that's fun jujitsu, that's entertaining jujitsu. I, I don't like stalling, looking at the timer, looking at the advantages, playing that. Maybe that's, you know, wrong. If you, if you want to win the competition, that's a good mindset to have. That's a good game plan to have. There's a lot of it nowadays in, I think, in jujitsu, a lot of that style. People go to the competition, that mindset. They either want to try and, they want to win at all costs. Whereas I think back in the day, it was a lot more, People would go there and it would just try stuff, you know, go for go for it. You know, you know if you lose, you lose. But and I think that brings better jiu-jitsu for spectators anyway. But the sport's growing. I think we're eventually going to get black belt world champion at adult, you know, because the best guys in the world are, are coming here now as well to teach. And you know, you got young kids coming through that have started jiu-jitsu from as, as early as they could walk, and we are catching up. Yes, I think the stage is the UK is healthy and there's clubs popping up everywhere. Maybe I was in too much rush. Maybe I was in too, too much of a rush to get there, was, which one of the things I tell guys here is don't rush it, take your time because you only have a short period of each belt. You know, if you, in the scheme of things, if you look at it, like once you get your black belt, you might be a black belt for 20, 30 years, but you might only be a purple belt for two years, you might only be a brown belt for two years. So don't rush it because you never get that chance to be that belt again and trust that when the coach decides it's time, it's time. Uh, maybe I was in too much of a rush. I was very competitive back then and I just wanted to train all the time and I wanted to win all the time and I wanted to get as good as I could, as quick as I could. And maybe I would have just said to myself, slow down a little bit, you know, I could have had a bit, more, maybe a little bit longer, you know, not being in such a rush. So, um, I think it's a good advice to pick, give people to develop one area first to get very good at that area. And that's kind of what I did. I did it kind of by fluke. I used to get pushed onto my back and that led to me working guard. I didn't choose, to, I just got used to get pushed there when I started and then I, you know, I started getting good at guards and I didn't until later on develop the top game. And I, I think that's a good, I was going to say maybe have uh, developed my, my, my top game more earlier, but I don't think actually, I, need, I, I think I did things you know, the right way. Um, but maybe just slow down a little bit with my eagerness, competitiveness. You know, I was very competitive. I didn't, I didn't always enjoy training because I was too serious. Mark used to say to me, too competitive sometimes, you know, but I think if I wasn't so competitive, I wouldn't have uh, won so much in competition. I didn't go to training to, to talk or to be friends. I used to go there to get better on it. I started teaching in, yeah, Lion's Den, Lion's Den Gym in Chadwick. Um, and that was a case of like, um, 
There was a studio at the back of the gym, there was a weightlifting gym, there was a studio at the back of the gym, and I started off by just, I taught the guy who owned the gym a couple of private lessons a week, and in exchange he would allow me to use the studio, and that's how it was, that was the deal. So I had the studio kind of for free, had mats taped them down, literally sellotaped them down. I started teaching in there, yeah, that's how, that's how it started, and then the class grew. Um, I think because we were, a studio with glass doors inside a weightlifting gym. We had eyes on us straight away, people. And jiu-jitsu, again, this, even, this was a, a good, good few years ago, but it wasn't a lot of jiu-jitsu clubs around. So people were starting to know what it was. People started to come in. It built up pretty quickly. And then we outgrew that place. And then we went to, yeah, we went to Chibwell School. That was just um, just a school hall, really. I laid mats, laid mats down. Jigsaw mats now. I don't know why we left there. I think it was just a distance for a lot of people because going from Chadwell Heath, where we were, to Chigwell wasn't the, wasn't the closest, so we came back over this way and moved up the road to Rockford. So we found this gym. This, this was a Pilates studio, and they were in a contract that they wanted out of it. So we started sort of subletting it off them, you know, coming in, laying the mats down. They were still using it, so all their stuff was in it. We used to have to move their stuff, lay the mats down, do the class, put the mats away. It was kind of doing that for a while, and then when their contract was up, we took over the building. Um, I could barely afford to pay it, like I was. 23, 24, had this, had this building in the high street in Romford. But I, I had enough guys, I had enough students that we could afford to, to cover it just about, you know. Um, but yeah, it wasn't really making any money, but it was paying for itself. And it just gave me a place to train. And um, it was hard then because I just, I was doing everything, you know, I was cleaning the gym, I was mopping the mats, teaching the classes, I was trying to do the advertising, it was like everything at once. Um, so that was, what year was that, 2008, I think then. From now, I started working in the Angel MMA clinic. So I got contacted by um, Graham, he's my business partner now. He was opening a gym, it was him and Paul. Um, they were opening a, an MMA gym and they wanted a jiu-jitsu coach. So eventually I went down there, um, I say eventually because they tried to get me to do it for free <laughs> at first. Then. That, that wasn't going to happen because I was too busy here. You know, Graham being Graham offered me a gold card, you know, got me a membership at his, his new gym. And I said, no, no, I haven't got time for that. I've got my own gym, I'm busy. So then he made a couple of offers and eventually I, I, well, I went to talk to teach there. So that's how I started teaching in Angel. Um, and I still had my gym in Romford. This gym then became a my clinic and that's how it started to grow and built up students, students got the higher belts. When we became a my clinic, that was when I, I started the the Michael Russell BJJ team logo. Still a small thing then, still maybe one, two gyms. And then as that grew, as I got more guys, I got more black belts and they branched out, we changed that again. We took my name out of it. We made it Odyssey BJJ. Um, we kept the logo, uh, the fists. The fist logo has been our logo from the beginning. We kept that and we just changed the name. And you know, that's what we are now, Odyssey BJJ. Um, we've got gyms um, in, yeah, we've still got Angel, Romford. We've got a gym in Harlow, Hartford. Um, Buckinghamshire, we've got one in Dorset, and then there's now one in Highlands as well. So we're growing and growing. Um, and yeah, long might continue as guys develop and, and get their get their black belts if they want to open more gyms, then yeah, it'd be, it'd be cool. I'm excited to just keep building the gym. I want it to expand. I want it to have something that just grows and grows and just have a, just have a team. I want to, I want to build honestly to be out there competing with these big gyms, these big team names. It's going to take us years. It's going to take us time. That's the plan. But I'm excited. I've got a lot of youngsters coming through, young kids that are going to be very, very good, awesome black belts one day. So I'm excited for that. Don't go in the guards. That's always my advice. Write things down. Make notes. That's very important. That's not something that most people do. You know, write down everything you learn, put it in your own words. You know, it doesn't have to be that you know the names of the moves. Just call them what you want as long as you understand them. Write things down. Just keep going. This, you know, don't get disheartened. It's, it's hard when you start. Try and compete once at least at every belt. Just, you know, for experience, competition isn't for everyone. That's not why everyone does it. You know, some people don't do it. Some people, you know, just do it to come and, you know, have somewhere to get fear, or some people come in because they like the environment, like the people, they have friends in here. But I think everyone, should just change himself at least uh, at least once at every belt. Go and see how good you are, you know, go and see how, how you do. You, know, you might surprise yourself. You know, sometimes you get the guys that you wouldn't expect to do well in competition. 
overachieve, you know. So I think it's I think it's quite important for people's development. You don't want to go all the way to black belt and have never completed, which that it does happen. You know, some people get a black belt through just doing private lessons. You know, they don't even spar. Like it's that has happened. It does happen. But, um, I think for you to do it properly, you should try and compete once at every belt, even if it's not your your main focus. Try and do it once at every belt. Try and do it's, that's only five five times. Yeah, so. But there was a competition, and I'm not going to mention any names. I think Mike was a purple belt at the time, over in West London. And this is a true story, by the way. And I don't care who's, because it's the truth, and I'm going to speak the truth, right? So who, who doesn't like it, go away and look in the mirror and, and ask yourself why you don't like the truth. And I wasn't the only witness to this, by the way. There's a lot of other witnesses. So Mike's competing against this guy. And it's back in the day, so there's a lot of, you know, people that are refereeing that shouldn't be refereeing because they know the person in there. And I've done that as well, but there's no one else or you try and step out and you can't. But anyways, on this particular day, uh, Mike was competing against this guy. And he, <laughs> it was really surreal because I was watching this in real time and I was thinking, really? So he passed the guy's guard, right? And he got to side control. I'm shouting to the referee, points ref. Mike's looking at me, looking at the referee. Referee's not doing, the referee turned his back on the fight, took his sock off, shook his sock around, put his sock around. Meanwhile, the guy has recovered the guard on Mike. So then he's turned back around and didn't give the points. So I said, I looked at Mike in the middle of the fight and I said, Mike, this guy's not gonna let you win. He's going to do everything. I said, he's totally, because we're having a conversation. We had that wonderful synergy. I'd, if I called his name, he would look over. Whereas sometimes I'm shouting at my guys and I'm screaming at them like, look, look, I'm, I'm trying to give them instructions. Mike would always look over and go, and I'd go to him, look, the left hand, and I'd get feed it to the collar. And he would do exactly what I asked him to do. And I said to him, look, the guy's going to try and cheat you out of winning. The, and I'm talking about the referee now. It was totally unprofessional, but it is what it is. And so Mike um, got into a bit of a scramble with this guy and then triangled him and then left it sort of in no doubt. But that was probably a, a, one of the funniest moments that we shared. But there were lots of them. We went to the Euros together. We, we traveled, you know, all over the world doing jujitsu and all over the country, you know, competing. And we had some wonderful times.